Hey everybody, what's up? It's Embedded Systems time. Seriously folks, a long time ago I made a video about Embedded Systems. I told you all that it was great. This is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. It's something that I work on all the time. And then I haven't really touched it since. But all of that needs to change because it's too great a topic. And so starting today and in the coming months, I'm going to try to squeeze some more embedded systems videos in with my other videos. And for today's video, I'm not gonna get into a lot of details, but I wanna talk about how you get started. Some of you have asked, how do I get started in embedded systems? Today, I wanna give some advice because this space can be a little bit tricky. Some of you may be at a university that doesn't have an embedded systems class, or maybe you're in high school and you definitely don't have an embedded systems class at your high school. And you're just trying to figure out how to get your hands on this stuff because it's cool. And you're trying to figure out what to ask mom and dad to buy you for Christmas or something like that. So let's see if I can give you a little bit of help today. First of all, for those that have no idea what I'm talking about, embedded systems are just systems, computing systems, that are embedded in things. Very loosely speaking, when we talk about embedded systems, we're talking about systems that are not laptops, desktops, phones, or servers. They could be dishwashers, toys, cars, airplanes, drones, robots. These are all different kinds of embedded systems. So let's say you're really excited about embedded systems. You want to try this out a little. Where do you get started? My first piece of advice is to learn C. I know, big surprise. Coming from me, coming from this channel, I talk a lot about C, but I'm serious. Most of the embedded systems work that I do is either in C or in C++. The reason for that is simple, and that's that most of the microcontrollers I work on those are the processors in these little embedded systems, have very little memory, and you may not be able to run a Java virtual machine or a Python interpreter or a Ruby interpreter. These things just take up too much memory. No one's ported them over, but you can pretty much find a C compiler for any processor that's ever been created. So if you've never seen C, is it the end of the world? No but a little bit of C is going to help a lot with understanding anything that I say about embedded systems and pretty much anything you see out on the internet talking about embedded systems. But you can learn as you go. I just think that learning C on a laptop or on a desktop is going to be a lot easier than learning on a microcontroller. And so you might wanna start by looking at some of my beginner videos and some of the other beginner videos that are out there on the internet. Basically try to do a little bit of C programming before you dive into microcontrollers because it might keep your life a little more sane. Take this advice as from a friend who wants you to enjoy embedded systems. Learn at least some C first. My number two piece of advice, or number one if you choose to throw my first piece of advice out the window and decide not to learn C, is to pick a platform. This basically means pick the hardware that you want to learn on. And this is a very personal choice. It can depend a lot on what you want to do. Maybe you have a project in mind, something that you would actually like to play with. You've got a drone or a robot or a toy or something that you want to build. Maybe you have a kit in mind that you're going to buy that has a particular microcontroller. But each hardware choice comes with different trade-offs and embedded systems work tends to be very specific to the hardware that you are working on. And so you want to put a little thought into what hardware you are going to be working on. Maybe you're doing this for work, maybe you're doing this for a class and the platform is already picked for you. But for this video, I'm assuming you have a choice. And that choice comes with some consequences because each piece of hardware out there can do different things and can do different things well. Some platforms have more memory or they're more powerful, while others may conserve more energy. Maybe they don't use very much energy and so if you care about battery life and you're making a wearable or some kind of mobile device, this matters to you. And different hardware platforms come with different software options and different communities. Never underestimate the power of community. If you are one of a hundred developers working on a particular platform, you are probably going to get less help than if there are a million other developers all working on this platform. So let's talk specifics. I wanna give you a couple of recommendations that might be helpful. And to be clear, no one is sponsoring this video. No one is paying me to say any of this. This is just the stuff that I use in my work, stuff that I've used in the classroom and stuff that I think will be useful for beginners. And I'm going to talk about a range of options here. And the right option for you is going to depend a lot on your style and what you hope to get out of it. So one question at this point to ask yourself is, what am I looking for? Are you looking for a fairly easy platform to get something up and running really quickly? Or are you looking to really dive in and understand everything about a system? You wanna understand the nuts and bolts. And if you're on the former side, you're looking for an easy up and running, let's, let's get started quickly and get something put together really fast. I recommend you start with Arduino or Energia, which is just an Arduino clone that provides support for some of the Texas Instruments microcontrollers that aren't supported by Arduino. 
Arduino has a lot of different software out there. There are a ton of tutorials, a ton of examples, and a lot of different hardware options that are compatible with it. I recommend that you find one that's commonly used, like maybe this Arduino Uno right here. So this guy, this right here is an Arduino Uno. It's probably the most commonly used Arduino on the market, and that's why I recommend it. There's great software support for it. A lot of people use it. You'll see it used in a ton of projects. It's not the smallest, it's not the lowest power thing out there, but it has a great community, and so it's a really good one to learn with. So one of the many projects that I'm working on is I've been working with Ms. Bargeron's class at R.C. Edwards Middle School back in South Carolina, trying to help 6th, 7th, and 8th graders actually learn how to do some embedded systems coding. Uh, well, not just the coding, but we also do some electronics work, and we've been using these Arduinos. So I've seen a lot of successes at the middle school level using these devices, and so that makes me think that they're pretty good for beginners. I'll link to the Arduino homepage in the description below. There are a ton of examples, both on that website and on other websites. Arduino also comes with its own IDE, otherwise known as Integrated Development Environment, and those of you that have watched a lot of my videos may know that I'm not a huge fan of IDEs, but for brand new beginners, someone just getting started, this is not a bad place to start. Just keep in mind that anything you do with that IDE can be done using a make file from the terminal once you really want to understand everything that's going on under the hood. Now the programs that you write in Arduino are written in C, well technically it's C++, but you don't really use many of the characteristic C++ constructs, and so you may not realize it is C++ unless you get into creating your own reusable Arduino software modules, which we'll get into later on in a future video. But for now, let's move on to option number two. Because Arduino does have some downsides. Some people consider it embedded systems light, which I think is a little unfair because there's a lot of great stuff. There's a lot of professional grade stuff that has been done with Arduino. I actually use Arduino in a lot of my work, uh, mostly for instrumenting experiments, and it's probably done more than any other platform on the earth, except maybe the Raspberry Pi, to bring embedded systems to the masses. But let's say instead that you want to become a low-level embedded systems expert. You want to know everything, you've got control issues, and you really want to know everything that's going on on that processor and in that hardware all the time. If that's you, then Arduino might not be the best option because with Arduino, there's a lot of software. There's a lot of layers of software that are doing different things that might get in your way. For example, on my research prototypes, I usually don't use Arduino because we're usually very, very fixated on getting the power draw as low as we possibly can. And a lot of the stuff that Arduino does for us, for simplicity, for convenience, sometimes gets in the way of my ability to actually optimize my own software. For my research prototypes, I need more control. If this is you, you need to find the microcontroller you want to work with and start writing C code for it. I tend to use Texas Instruments MSP430 processors because they're crazy low power and they have FRAM, which is really useful for a lot of the batteryless work that I do. If you don't want to use the Texas Instruments microcontrollers, you can always use the Admega microcontrollers, which are the ones on the Arduino that I just showed you. And you could just ignore all that Arduino software and just, or comb through the software and try to figure out what it's doing. The point is, is to find a microcontroller and start writing code for it. Now it's important to keep in mind that this is learning the hard way. You're going to do a lot of interfacing with hardware. You're going to be reading a lot of bits and bytes from hardware registers. You're going to be learning how to configure clocks and timers. You're going to be learning how to handle interrupts. Lots of details, lots of good juicy things to learn. This is not for the faint-hearted, but in the end, you will probably understand what's going on on that microcontroller at a level that most Arduino users will never actually get to. So there is a payoff. If you decide to go this route, you can usually find a version of GCC or Clang that will support the microcontroller that you're working with, as well as the binary tools, Make and GDB or LLDB. You're undoubtedly going to spend more time looking at the processor's manual, the user guide, and looking through data sheets. And you may find fewer example programs and poorer documentation. Consider yourself warned. But it's pretty awesome when you get over the learning curve because you really understand how things work. It allows you to do a lot of cool things. And that brings me to my third platform recommendation, which is the Raspberry Pi. I don't have a Raspberry Pi here to show you, but the Raspberry Pi is more powerful, it has a beefier processor, it has more memory, and it runs Linux, for heaven's sake. So if you're looking for something that feels more like your laptop, that feels more comfortable, or maybe you've got a big piece of software that runs on a laptop, runs, runs on Linux, and you need it to run on your embedded device, and you don't want to spend a lot of time porting it, then the Raspberry Pi might be the option for you. The Raspberry Pi has a solid community, there are lots of examples out there, good support, and in my experience it works really well. The downsides are you've got a lot of software sitting between you, the programmer, 
and the hardware that it's running on. On one hand, this means that you can do things like run Python scripts and use your familiar Linux environment, assuming that Linux is familiar to you. On the other hand, it means that interacting with hardware may be a little more complicated. And I find that students using the Raspberry Pi don't understand what the hardware is doing or how your code is interacting with the hardware at the same level that you would with the other options. And of course, if you don't know Linux, then that's not gonna be a help anyway. In my research lab, we use Raspberry Pis. We use all these options, but we tend to use the Raspberry Pi for base stations for when we want to take some devices we've connected up and we wanna help connect their data up to the internet, to a database somewhere. Maybe we wanna run a database on our actual gateway, or we have some piece of Linux software that we really don't wanna port over, then we might use a Raspberry Pi. It's definitely a solid option that you should consider. So those are my recommendations. I put a bunch of links in the description, a lot of helpful content and web pages, and there are definitely other options there, and I'm sure I've left out some of your favorites. If I have, please let me know in the comment section what you think I should have included. And of course, stay tuned in the coming months as I produce some more videos about embedded systems for all of you embedded systems enthusiasts or those of you that are just curious out there. So I hope that helps you get started. Happy coding, and until my next video, I'll see you later.